Welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, Chicago's digital startup hub. We have a great and uh, very accomplished founder today, Tom Sosnoff, founder of Tasty Trade, Thanks founder so of Thinkorswim. Uh, so great to have you here. Thanks. Thank you. And we have Tom's bobblehead, who will be <laughs> answering questions as well. Please, please specify if the question is for Tom or the bobblehead. Um, so Tom, you obviously uh, have a great story, but not everyone uh, may know your market. So. Uh, Maybe just tell people the, the one minute version of what uh, Thinkorswim was, just, just as a company so they would know it, and then your current company, Tasty Trade, what it is, and we'll come back to it. But just so they have the context, they know you're successful, but they may not be customers. What, sure. what would that be? Sure, so um, I guess you want me looking to you, right? That's, yeah, you can do this. Yes. Okay, whatever works. I'm not sure where the camera is, um, but. That's you right there. Perfect. So He does the show, so he's very conscious of this. He's a pro, I'm an amateur, so. <laughs> I'm still shaking up over the introduction, you see, because I'm, so just people that don't know or haven't met me before or haven't listened, um, I've been on the road for 17 straight years now. And when I say on the road, all I do is speak. So I speak at events, mostly I do my own stuff, and I have this special rule, no introductions. I just come up, I tell my story, I've got a whole pit, you know, just a whole discussion. And uh, so when Christy said, I'm doing the introduction for you, I'm like, oh shit, this is not gonna work. <laughs> and uh, and of course, she, she, she pulled it off somehow. Anyway, um, you know, we have this. We had this idea years ago that something was messed up with finance, and we like the consumer side of the business. So, to put it in a nutshell, we're just kind of advocates for um, for consumers when it comes to finance. We never really knew what we were doing, or what like like we never tried to solve a problem. We never set out to to ac accomplish something specific. We just said we're going to change technology. We're going to change content. And we're also going to do a few other things along the way, like products and things like that. And we'll see where it falls. And that's it. Got it. And the uh, um, for those who didn't know Thinkorswim, how would Ameritrade have described it when they bought it for such a large, I think, $750 million? What, what did they describe the business and why they were buying it? Everybody that ever described um, Thinkorswim to, every time we tried to describe Thinkorswim to anybody, and anytime anybody ever put money in it, the first thing they would say to us is, this is probably the worst business we ever bought. And so, so I always got the, you know, everybody was always trying to play down the, the value and stuff. In fact, I, I don't know if I told you this story, but the first time we ever raised capital for, for Thinkorswim, we, we were a pretty young company. We're only about four years old, and Christy had just joined us as uh, our CFO. And we sat around with a private equity firm, TCB Technology Crossover Ventures at the time, and they gave us $22.5 million on a $100 million valuation. Now, we're just a bunch of floor traders from, from the SIBO in a prior life, and we had rolled all our money over the years into this Thinkorswim venture. And we sat around this uh, conference table at our first board meeting, and volatility was really cheap over that summer. And we sat around, they gave us the money in like April, and it was probably June expiration, it was really quiet, and there was nothing going on in the markets, and we sat around the table and they said, hey, um, uh, this is after they'd written us a check for $22.5 million, but we never cashed the check because we didn't need the money, we were profitable already. We just thought we were, raise money when you can was always the rule among kind of, you know, well, I thought the rule was among entrepreneurs. So we sat around the table and they kind of said, they looked at each other, two partners at this private equity firm, looked at each other and said, this is the worst company we've ever invested in. <laughs> they quite said, a honeymoon. Quite a honeymoon. This is our first board meeting. This is the worst company we ever invested in. I can't believe we gave you a $100 million valuation. Now the cool thing for us was that we never cashed a check. And we don't like these guys anyway because they were just miserable, you know, SOBs and the whole deal. So so we said later we'll find out how they invested in the second company. Yeah. <laughs> so we said to them, so we said, you know what? We're gonna do something that nobody's ever done before. We're gonna give you your money back. And they said, we'll take it. And so the first discussion we ever had at our first board, because you're saying, what did people think of us? We said, we'll give you your money back, minus whatever brokerage fees, you know, investment banker fees they had. And they said, fine, we'll take it. And we thought that they were bluffing, and they thought we were bluffing, but we weren't bluffing, and and nobody was bluffing. And so we kind of like got to the point of writing out the check, and then they're like, they're like, nah, I think we'll, I think we'll let, let us think about this for a little bit longer. And so they had this public meeting they, where they were talking to each other in front of us, like you know how sometimes you talk about your kids, but you're talking loud enough so everybody. So that's exactly what they did in front of us. And one partner says to the other partner, "Do you think this is the really the worst company we ever invested in?" And, and the other guy looks at him and he says, no, I think Netflix is worse than these guys. 
they had put like $50 million into Netflix. They were the first investor. So, so you know, and, and just to show you how nobody knows anything, that's the whole nobody knows anything story because they ended up selling, get, they made, ultimately they made, you know, I don't know, eight or nine times their money on us and they made, I don't know, a few billion dollars easily on Netflix. So, and then they invested us again the second time around. So, and when TD bought Thinkorswim, they said the same thing. They said, you know, they sat us down. They said, listen, we, you know, your, your software is okay. Your name stinks. We hate it. We're changing it tomorrow. And, um, and uh, your customers aren't as good as you think they are and nothing. And then we're like, well, why are you buying us? And they're like, <laughs> well, because we lose all our customers to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> so originally they thought they could, if you can't, if you can't beat, you know, we just, we'll just outbuild them. And then they found out later on, they can't really do that. So they ended up um, buying us. And, and I'll tell you a funny story, Pat. They, they tried at first. They said, we hate the name Thinkorswim. It doesn't fit our model. We're TD, we're TD Ameritrade. We're TD Bank, the whole deal. None of this fits our model. So we're going to change you. We're going to change the name to the ultimate trading platform. And I, this is a true story. The ultimate trading platform was the name. They go, because we can't stand the name. So, so I looked at the CEO and I go, dude, don't do that, okay? People love the name Thinkorswim and they love this company. If you change this to the ultimate trading platform, they're all gonna leave. You know, they don't like that name. This is kind of, we built something special. They said, well, so they hired, they said, I, we'll see. So they hired a consulting company to go out and see which brand was more valuable, TD Ameritrade to traders or Thinkorswim. And it came back 10 to one in favor of Thinkorswim over TD Ameritrade customers. And so they, they said, that's gotta be wrong. They spent another million dollars <laughs> trying to figure out those numbers were right. They came back again and said, it's closer to 95%. <laughs> and so they said, okay, we'll keep the name. So today, it's 50% of their transactional business. Wow. 50% of transactional business. They're the largest transaction firm in the world when it comes to the number of trades made. 50% of it is done on this platform, over 50% is done on the platform. And 90, I would say, their, their business went from 9% derivatives to 56, 57% derivatives just since they introduced that platform. So they've That's completely incredible. changed their whole business around. So I, it's I think, really, it's an incredible story. Now, um, it's amazing that you built that. And it's, uh, I like the going against, you know, the adversity and conventional wisdom wrong every time. And you're a pretty good, pretty good company with Reed Hastings and Netflix there. So Yeah, yeah, we, we'd like to be them. <laughs> so let's go, let's go back to the beginning. So you're not a Chicagoan, but you've lived here a long time. 36 years. So where are you from originally? Ta tell people a little bit about you know, sure. you as a, as a youth. As a youth. As a youth. Yeah. He's, um, he'll see where he's from. <laughs> I'm, I grew up outside of New York City in a place called White Plains. I grew up, I was born and raised in New York, in New York City. My mom was a grad student at Columbia. And uh, then we moved to the suburbs and, and we lived, you know, I, I stayed there until I moved to Chicago, I guess. Um, so I, I grew up just outside of New York City, about 20 miles. And, uh, you know, where you're, Talk a little bit about your parents. Were what were they doing? What was your my, what was your you know young life like? What you were my mom ran. An, my mom was an artist, and she had an art school for girls only, and she did that for fifty five years. Wow. So she was a uh, she ran her own business, and oh, then great. my dad was a uh, professor at Yale Law School and also a uh, labor lawyer. So you 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 really have a lot of academic in your in yes. your background. So growing up. What, what, were you, what were you thinking you'd do? Like, what did, what did you like to do? What did you enjoy to do? And what, as you thought about your future, did, what influenced you? Well, actually, I was really concerned about that because my family was so academic and I wasn't. And so I was a little worried. I think I told Pat the story when we were prepping for this today. But um, back when I was, I just turned 60. So, so um, I've been doing this. I've been in Chicago for 36 years and I've been doing this for 36 years. But when I was... 17 and my little sister was 15 my parents sat us down on the couch in the living room no parent ever do this today and my parents were were bright and they were you know they were part of academia and the whole deal they sat us down we said they said we only have enough money to send one of the two of you to private school and we chose your sister <laughs> so they're like they're like we think it's not that we don't love you it's just that <laughs> It's just like, we think that she will use the money better than you. And I was like, I was like, that, make, that makes sense. Now, if you try to do that today, your kids oh. will sue you. <laughs> yeah. But um, my, you know, we, I was cool with it. So I went to a state school and I went to SUNY Albany, which is um, in Albany, New York, obviously. And it's the state system in, you know, in, right. in New York. So you get out of SUNY and, and you go to Manhattan. 
Tell us a little bit about I get what? out of SUNY, I get a job with Drexel Burnham, which is no longer around. But it was the firm at the time. Was the firm. And I was there for nine months, met a bunch of guys that said, if you, because I was. Why did you go there? Because it wasn't the academic route. Because they offered me a job. Got it. Well, that's I mean, a good you reason. Know, when you're 20, remember, I graduated college in 1979. And 1979 was the middle of kind of an ugly recession. Interest rates had just, they just crossed up. They, they just got over 18% short-term rates, and they were on their way to 20%. There was no jobs. And so um, it was an ugly recession. And there were, you know, I was part of that baby, baby boomer era. So when I got out of school, you know, if you got a job offer but anywhere. You got, but you got a job at the... Hot, one of the hot firms in the world, right? Or was yeah. it? That was it? Was it there at that time? Oh yeah, no, no, yeah. they were they were a great firm. It was totally just stupid blind luck. I said something, you know. Some I have this theory. Well, I shouldn't say I have it. I didn't know if I had it then, but my entire career I've tried to do say things to differentiate myself. And like I did a speech on Monday afternoon, and I talked to a bunch of um, uh, master students at IIT, and and. I talk about differentiation because everybody's smart. And so how do you differentiate yourself from everybody else? You, you need some kind of story and, and some kind of, it's not really actually a story. You need some kind of logic that makes sense because if you assume that everybody's smart in almost everything you do, which we do, and we challenge people intellectually, then you can challenge your interviewer intellectually with a logic chain. And we try to do that with everything that we do. You know, so so. so um, do you think back to getting the job on Wall Street at one of yeah. the top firms? Um, do you remember how you pulled that off? How I pulled off getting the job? Yeah. Well, I just went for the, I mean, somehow I got the, I don't even know. Like, I, You, you I knew know. your strat, your Jedi mind tricks worked? Uh, whatever. I mean, I might have been the right day in the right okay. place, you know. So you're there. I didn't bribe them. I didn't have any money, so it was But there okay. you're, it's a place, I mean, Wall Street, you're making good money now. No, well, when we when I got out of school, the the the, av the starting salary for Wall Street for entry level was $25,000. Okay. Because I remember that. that was my first deal, 25,000 bucks. So you're, you're working there, you're in a training program? Training program. And, uh, but you end up in Chicago at the end of this chapter, why? Tell, tell us a little bit about how so, that happened. I'll tell you a funny, so I get my first job and I'm all excited because I'm working for a big firm. They're, you know, they're putting us up in hotels, they're flying us around, they're training us. It's really interesting. And I meet these two guys and they're about 10 years older than me. And they called me aside one day and they said, we, we want to leave this firm because they suck. And even though I thought they were great because I just got there. <laughs> so now I'm this 22-year-old kid and I'm completely confused. These guys are telling me they stink and I'm thinking it's the greatest firm in the world. So they said, we're going to give you an opportunity that, that you, that's unbelievable because you're, you're, you're 22 or 23, I don't remember, 23 maybe, and you're single. And if you move to Chicago to trade on the trading floor, we'll put up the money which at the time they put up $50,000. They offered $50,000. And remember, I only had about $1,500. I had about $1,500 to my name, but in my first six months at Drexel, I had made 400 trades through their platform, and they didn't even have a platform, it was over the phone. So I traded more in the first six months at Drexel than, the entire, than their entire workforce did. So they had about 1,000 employees, and my 400 trades were the most of everybody. I think if you added them all together. Why was that? Because I don't know. I was turned out I was a junkie. I don't know. So <laughs> I have no idea. I just bit into this whole thing. And, and so. So you're a fanatic, and they know it. And they're like, we're, we're, this is our fanatic. How do we get him to represent us so they go, in Chicago? So one of the guys borrowed $50,000 from his father and said, if, you, if I take the 50000 to Chicago and trade on it, they, I would fill some orders for them, and then I would trade for myself. I had no idea what it meant. I took a flight to Chicago one day. Before you do, what, what is it that you think made them so excited about that opportunity? I have no idea. When you get, is it, I mean, why? It's, it's sort of a random thing to say, yeah. hey, by the way, I'm not gonna leave my job, but you should leave your job, and I'll write you a big check to go do this. They didn't have any friends. You know, <laughs> you know. They, they were clearly outcasts. They, they, they were like, you know, I don't, I have no idea. And I've never even talked to them since. So here's the crazy thing. That's a traitor for you. So I hop on a plane, come to Chicago. I had never been west of the East River. You ever see those, you ever see those New Yorker where they have the big picture where everybody in New York thinks the world ends at the East River, which is basically what surrounds Manhattan? I had never been west of there, ever, anywhere. So I came to Chicago. I had no idea where I was. I'm 20. 
three years old at the time, reasonably smart, but not, you know, not academically smart, street smart. And I end up in this city and I had knew nothing. So somebody said, you gotta take a drive up Lakeshore Drive. So I paid this, so I go to this cab driver, I wanna take a drive up Lakeshore Drive, but I'm from New York, I'm skeptical. So I say to the guy, I'm gonna give you 50 bucks to drive me up and down Lakeshore Drive. Just one time I wanna check it out, but I don't wanna be on the meter. Put a piece of tape on the meter. The guy goes, nah, he goes, it'll be less than that. I go, no, no, I heard, I heard that it's like a lot of money. So I paid him 50 bucks and he put a piece of tape on the meter and he drove me up and down Lakeshore Drive. When we got back to where he dropped me off, I go, he goes, do you want to see? I go, yeah, just for the hell of it, let me see what it was. Because he had to leave the meter on, $17. <laughs> it's my first bad trade. <laughs> so but, but you, so t talk about the first time you went to the trading floors. Got on it, walked to the trading floor. They knew somebody. He was a lawyer. For, he, was an, he never practiced, but he was a kid that went to NYU Law School, got his law degree, but never practiced, came to Chicago. I met him on the floor just to say hi because he was going to walk me around. And he said, I walked on the floor and I never turned back. I walked on that floor, I was like, I am never leaving this place. It took me less than 60 seconds to know this is the coolest thing. Now remember, this is 1980. Okay, so people probably can't all picture this, so just yeah. paint the picture for everyone. It's 1980, it's a bunch of um, crazy, huge, sweaty guys screaming and yelling. And I had no idea what was going on and it's just complete chaos. And it, for some people, that just resonates and it resonated with me. And I didn't exactly know what was going on. I had $50,000 in an account. The guys that backed me lost the $50,000 two weeks after I got there. I had made $13. So I had a $13 left over and they lost all 50 grand. I had no money, no job, and I had I'd paid rent for one more month and that was it. So I was totally fucked. That's it. So how'd you bounce back? I, um, I scr you know, you, you scramble. I scrounged around, found a job working for somebody. I borrowed $100,000 from somebody else that I met, and, and I, I was one of the survivors. You know, there's about five to five, three to five percent of the people survive down there. I was one of those guys. That's all. Well, you go from $13, $13 to, yeah. bar, to borrowing $100,000. Obviously, something, how'd you Talk pull to, that you, up? It's just, you, you got to have a good story. <laughs> uh, I, 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 you have the same, you know, somebody once said when we, were, when we were buying a company and we were raising money and we've done a lot of deals over the years. Christy and I have done uh, uh, more than a you know, handful of deals. And they said, it's harder to do a deal for, you know, $10,000 is to do a deal for $10 million. So, and I think for raising money, it was the same thing. If you ask for $10,000, you would be lucky to get $5,000. If you ask for $100,000, maybe you get a quarter million. I don't know. Right. So you... Um... So you not only do well, but the world starts to shift at some point yeah. in terms of technology. Talk a little bit about, because um, this leads to your transition to think sure. swim. talk a little bit about how that world was shifting, what you saw, and, uh, and how that evolved into Thinkorswim. Sure. Well, for those of you that don't know much about listed markets, before, before the dot-com boom of 19, and a lot of you are young, so, so this is gonna go back to like you were, you were small, but the, the, before the dot-com boom of 1998 to 2000, the, the markets were um, very inefficient and there wasn't a lot of technology. Everything was done kind of over the phone or on paper and, and nobody had really kind of changed the industry. And as soon as we saw the world kind of changing. And, and as floor traders, you sense everything, you know, you're always skeptical of every everything. And and we realized really we realized very quickly that the whole business was going to change in a very short period of time as everything went electronic and everything became duly listed and everything else. So after this is almost 20 years on the floor for me, of which means you stand in a very little spot and you grind out a hell of a living, but it's you know, we saved a lot of money, and we built a we built a fifty person prop firm. So, and we managed a half a billion dollars. We had built a nice business for ourselves. And I turned to my partner Scott at the time, and I said, "Let's do something different," because you know I'd spent twenty years doing this. And he goes, "What do you want to do?" And I'm like, "I want to do. I want to build a completely different company. I want to build technology. It's time that we retooled ourselves." Now, the cool thing about this, and this is what I like to tell people, everybody here, this I'm in my forties now. So I'm like 42, 43, and we took everything we had at the time, which was substantial by, substantial, let's call that, and we didn't even tell our families, and we rolled the dice and invested it Wait, all can into can you this. say that again? Yeah. 
You didn't even tell your families. Yes, you have to lie sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> it's important. Um, you, you, so you, you come home, you're like, honey, what are you doing today? Oh, just the same old, same old. Well, we're starting a new company, but don't worry. It's, it's, it's not, not our, risky. It's not risky and it's not our money, <laughs> but it was all our money. And um, so of the money you made over the 20 years, how much did you put in the company? 100%. 100%. 100%. So, but we it. had been lying for years to our spouses and to our family about, <laughs> about, about how much money we were making, because we always told them we lost money every day, because that's how you survive. So, 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 so nobody- we won't, we won't send a link to your wife. <laughs> nah, so nobody believed us anyway. But, but we did roll everything that we had saved up over the prior 20 years, wow. because we thought Thinkorswim would take you know, a lot of money to start. We also were able to raise some money we were able to raise some money with, a, with some of the people that we managed money for. So we were able to raise another, you know, we, we got a commitment for $10 million. We actually only took $5 million, and then we ended up buying them out right away. So we actually never raised any money right away, but we had a commitment for money. So people liked our idea. So talk, talk about what the idea was and specifically what the market needs you saw. Okay. We don't do things. So here's the, one of the neat things about it. I mean, I don't know if it's unique to us, but... We don't do things based on market need. We don't solve problems and we don't do things based on market need. Most entrepreneurs that try to solve a problem or do things based on market need fail. So what we do is we try to follow a vision that is something we think we want. You know what I mean? It's just, it's, we have our own little ideas about the way things should be. And when we decided to do Thinkorswim, this is an, a fun story, we thought the markets were a little bit saturated and we were gonna build a platform for options on anything. We, we built a model that let us figure out implied volatility on anything. So you want implied volatility on this, doll, on this cup of iced tea, on your glasses, on this iPad, whatever it is. We built a model that let us figure out implied volatility, which meant that we could create basically a way to execute clear and write derivatives against any single, op any single product or collectible or anything else. So we called it options on anything. That was one idea we had. The other idea we had as a backup was to build a brokerage firm. As Soon as we got knee deep into building technology, we realized, okay, we have to go with what, you know, with what makes a lot more sense. So we decided that we're gonna solve, we're, we're going to solve a problem that we had, which was routing order. We love trading, but we had no way to route orders electronically through a front end that, 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 that did the things that we wanted it to do. And so we built that. So we went around, we learned about technology. The, the, for, from our perspective, from our side, we were just traders. So we didn't know anything about technology. So one of, the, one of the fun things about our story is that we basically built a technology firm and learned how to talk the talk, but we never learned anything about technology. We just went out, we, we took an approach where we, we said, we don't know anything about technology, so we need to find somebody that does. And that's really hard to do in the middle of a dot-com boom. 1999, 2000, there wasn't a single technologist around. So we hung out at um, coding competitions. They used to have things like Top Coder and, and uh, Google would have competitions and Microsoft would have competitions. So we hung out these coding competitions and we met these like 20 year old or 18 year old Russian kids and we said, what are you doing for the rest of your life? And they were like, nothing. And we're like, okay, let's, let's do business together. So we started a company in St. Petersburg with four people. Today they're the largest um, FinTech uh, development firm, one of the largest fintech development firms in the world with about 450 developers. We started them with four Russian kids in a garage and they basically built Thinkorswim. They lied to us and said that they knew how to build financial technology and we lied to them and said we understood technology. So <laughs> the first, uh, a fun part of the story is one of the first things we did when building Thinkorswim, we had to, we had to, back then you needed to have servers. So we had no test servers and we couldn't, there was too many rules about, um, you couldn't buy Sun Microsystems equipment in Russia. So we smuggled servers into Russia in suitcases so we could build a test environment so we could test Thinkorswim before we actually launched it. And then we launched Thinkorswim. It turned out to be the single best online brokerage platform in the world for about six or seven years. And it was an amazing company. So how, how did you get that early tech advantage? What do you attribute that to? Uh, a lot of luck. And, you know, the, I attribute almost all of our success to one kind of, and, and this is kind of a theme that runs through everything. We are very quick decision makers. 
And if you've been around successful entrepreneurs, the one characteristic that every single industry or every single really successful entrepreneur has is they can make a decision. Doesn't matter if they're right, doesn't matter if you're wrong, whatever it is, just make a quick decision. Make a damn decision. And so we have been, from the start, very good at making decisions because of our trading background. So if there's anything that, you know, we made a lot of bad decisions, but, but obviously we made more good decisions and just quick, quick moves. Got it, and I assume quick course corrections too? Um, quick course corrections, yeah, sure. We're, we're very comfortable, you know, we probably made a million trades in our life. And if you think about it, at least a few hundred thousand of those are losers. So we're pretty good. Yep. Yeah. So um, talk a little bit about how you got early traction. I mean, it's, you know, the thing about the dot-com boom was there were sure. lots of good ideas, but a lot of things didn't take off. So, a lot so of good ideas didn't take off. A lot a, of visions that eventually were successful didn't take off. So what did you do different? It's a great question. And remember, we started this company, Thinkorswim, in 1999. We launched it in 2001. If, for those of you that re remember markets in 2001, we we're in the middle of a meltdown. The NASDAQ was crashing. It had gone from 5,000 all the way down to 1,000. It was in the middle. It dropped 80%. Firms were, um, firms were selling off assets left and right. Everybody, every, almost every connectivity provider, every colo facility was going out of business. It was a nasty time. But again, we didn't care because that's, we're contrarians. So the best time to do everything is when everybody else is imploding. You talk, just for a minute, you, you said something kind of important there that I'd love to unpack if you don't mind. You started in 99, but you launched in 2001. So what, what did you do between 99 and 2001? Build the technology. Really? Yeah. Um, ever get a little nerve wracking that you've got a lot of money going out and not yet having any come in? Sure, every day, day and night. But your wife said you came home and said, we got a big order today, we got a big order, everything was great. I mean, that's a long time to keep the morale up. Well, she stopped talking to me in 1999, so then by 2001, it was like, it was like okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so, uh, so you get out there, two years of technology build, so that's a huge build. It's a, it was about, it was a little less than 18 months. Wow. Yeah, it took us a while to write the requirements. And we weren't stable for three years. I mean, it took a long time back then to be, the, the technology we built this year, we built the fastest platform in the industry in less than a year, and we have been, we have had 100% stability and we're the fastest platform. So we've learned a lot over the last 17 years. But in 2000, you know, we were still, we were still learning. We didn't, you know, you kind of cross your fingers and hoped you weren't down. So this is a little different market, the options market, than a lot of others, and that it's very, you can very much focus on. I think you said there are about a half million Targetable users, sure. Like that. So um, you had other companies you were competing with around the country. Yeah. You had a local company here, uh, Options Express. We had sure. we had David on, um, and uh, so tell us a little bit about how do you sort of crack the code on those early users? Because for most entrepreneurs who watch this kind of thing, they they feel like I have a great idea, I have a great product, but getting those users is hard. You were very creative. Talk a little bit about how you how you slayed that dragon. Two recommendations for people out there that are interested in, you know, that are really love entrepreneurship and building businesses. One, never be afraid to make a deal. And, and second, never be afraid to dilute and take money. And, and a lot of people, like, they they're really get concerned about, you know, ownership and um, size of the prize and everything else. We didn't care about any of that stuff. We thought if we were successful, everything will take care of itself. So every time we had an opportunity to make a deal to get better, we did. One of the first things we did was make a deal with a small education company that we knew they were snake oil salesmen, we knew they were, they were sketchy and everything else, but we needed to learn the customer side of the business. So we basically, I went on the road in 2001 and I haven't come home. You know, it's been 17 years. So let me unpack that for a minute here, just wanna, so part of it is you did a bunch of business development deals. Yes. And, and, um, and is that how you got the early users? Like how would that work if, if, uh, if you were to sort of generalize what you did I and mean, these, what was attractive about these firms and what made those deals work in terms of getting- They were like s investment education seminar companies. And when they had an opportunity- so They had an audience? They had an audience. They would spend a lot of money and they'd, they'd sell, upsell people on you know classes on some kind of, we, did, we were learning the whole thing at the, pro at the time too. We didn't really understand it. And so we, it's part of what ultimately inspired us to build Tasty Trade, but was, was just we hated the state of investor education and we wanted to completely change the world of content. But so let me ask you, did you learn, just learn from them or did they actually get you users? 
No, they actually got us users. So a lot of people, the reason I, I want to unpack it, Tom, just a lot of people end up in a situation where they say, I have this deal and they have, they have an audience, but they fail to convert. What is it about what you did, do you think, that um, made those deals work? Well, actually, in the world of finance, er nobody converts ex except us. And, and it was weird because we built this goodwill relationship with our customers. I mean, we basically were the only firm where the CEO of the firm and the president, whoever was running the firm, everybody was out there talking to customers. We, our, our entire management team spent years and years on the road. And we introduced ourselves to every customer and we built a relationship with hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, for people that, if, a lot of people think it can't be done and, and there's very few, you know, I like talking about the CEOs in the world of finance. And if you think about, you know, these multi tens, hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap out there. And most of these CEOs have never used their front end technology, have never made a trade, don't even understand the products, but they're in there kind of as a manager. That wasn't us. We use the products, we trade, and we understand our technology, and we also spend a lot of time with our customers. I mean, we looked at the value of a $2,000 customer the same as a $2 million customer. We've had that rule all along. So it didn't, for us, it was just like, hey, I can't believe this person even wants to listen to our story. So we're happy. If we look at your story, um, a lot of people would use the catchphrase today, content marketing. Yes. It's a hot thing now. You're yeah. obviously uh, do a fantastic job at it, but how, I guess, one, how did you recognize that as something you felt would be differentiating to talk about how you, you think? And then second, how did that develop and grow into a real capability that worked? Just a little about that story. So, so our mission, once we started building Thinkorswim, we knew our mission was to change technology in order to change finance and make it simple. But along the way, we realized, you know what? We're still, we built this really cool front end but people still don't really understand how to use the product and the strategies. So after we sold Thinkorswim, I wanted to do something else, which was build a media company. And, and just like we knew nothing about technology in 1999, we knew nothing about media, nothing at all. And so we decided that we're gonna try it again. And we're gonna build a media company from scratch. And we rented a hip hop studio over on Huron because they were going out of business. And we decided, okay, we're gonna see, we're gonna see if we can build something really cool. And our original game plan was to hire a bunch of comedians from Second City and Improv Olympics. And we loved it. And we we interviewed 40 kids. And I'll, I'll tell you, just if you can we tell a story? Yeah. Okay. So we bring 40 kids and they're all improv. They've all taken improv classes and they all know each other. We didn't know they all knew each other. They're like traitors, but there's a little world of improv comedians. So 40 of them show up at our, at our new studios and we go through each person and we say, tell us, you know, give us your shtick, tell us your best story, make a joke, do whatever you want. What do you know about finance? And obviously nobody knew anything and they were all brilliantly talented, but, but they just didn't know anything about what we were voting to do. So we narrowed the group of 40 down to 20 and we called them all back into the office and we pulled a little bit of kind of what Zappos does. We called 20 kids back in, and we, as they walked in the office in a little studio we had, we gave them each a check for 2,500 bucks. So we wrote $50,000 in checks total. We gave them the checks and we said, if anybody wants to leave, you can keep the 2,500 bucks. So I wanted to make sure we were picking the right kids. And then the other ones, everybody that wanted to stay, we said, okay, now that you want to stay, you have an opportunity to work for us. Come back in two weeks, give us your best thing on tape, Give us your best routine, give us your best story. We gave them titles to work on. Give us your best improv and we'll hire the top six people. And no matter what, you can keep the 2,500 bucks each. Now they're all starving artists. And so we were like, and they were all like, this is the greatest thing. Like they thought they were, you know, initially they thought we were kidnapping them. They didn't know what was going on. <laughs> like, I mean, they thought, you know, this is a crazy, what's going on? So we picked six. One is still with us today, six years later. One woman is, Vanetta is still with us today, but the other, the other five left to go on to do second sit, I mean, to do Saturday Night Live, to do all these sitcoms. But here's the problem. We picked six, we put them on the air to do this financial content. And we had this idea like, they're gonna tell jokes and they're gonna have all this crazy banter going back and forth. And every time they mention some company, we're gonna talk about a strategy, an investment strategy for that company and people will eat it up. They were so boring and so bad and so uninteresting that after watching them for about a month, we're like, oh my God, this is gonna be the biggest failure of all time. Nobody's gonna watch this network. 
So we took the whole thing over, we changed gears, and we built the largest digital financial company over the last six years in the world. And now that company does content marketing for a brokerage firm, which is called Tastyworks, and we built How many this- How have you seen Tom's show? Oh, it's pretty good, see? Yeah. That's so awesome. I have to say, those of you who haven't, uh, Christy's right, it, the set does have a little Howard Stern banter to it, but much more oh, appropriate. Definitely. Yeah. But it's fun, but you do a great job, and it's um, and you keep the energy up, which in that sort of thing, keeping it interesting and going is, is, is a lost art. Yeah, you try talking about finance for eight hours a day. <laughs> It'll kill it. <laughs> there is a lot of banter, and there's a lot of personalities. We, we did it all with traders, and we created, we helped to create personalities from all these people. And, and again- Can you bring entrepreneurs in? I've seen a few- We do, we do episodes. a segment called Bootstrapping. Christy does that now. Yeah. We've done almost 1,700 bootstrapping episodes since we started. But the neat thing about Tasty Trade, and the coolest thing is, we decided we're never dumbing down. Like if you, if you, if you watch our network, we're challenging you every 15 minutes, and we're giving you a takeaway every 15 minutes. We don't do news, and we don't do interviews. So we do eight hours a day of think tank research-based content, which is completely unique to finance because there's like CNBC, which is all interviews and, and business news, and there's Bloomberg, which is all interviews and business news. We don't do any of it. It's 100% strategic. And people were like, that'll never work. Nobody's gonna watch this. Nobody's gonna, you know. And we're like, this is what, again, this is what we wanna do. We have no commercials. So we're all content marketing. We've been profitable since, almost since day one. And we've built a really interesting business. We raised money again with the same firm that told us we were the worst firm ever. This time, they came back in with another 25 million. So, and so, so you have to explain, so something must have improved in the relationships subsequently. You know, you grow on people, you know. <laughs> You grow on people. We, they, the, 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 the private equity firms in America are, are very smart about one thing. If, you, if, you, if somebody is, does a good job for you, they come right back at you. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, that's encouraging, and, and I say this to everybody here that's, that's running a startup or that's, you know, that has that entrepreneurial spirit, as soon as you do something, as soon as you create some kind of goodwill, whether that goodwill is you give somebody content or whether that goodwill is you make somebody money, whatever, whatever qualifies as goodwill, the pers that person or persons or firm are very likely to come back and support you, whether that person is a consumer or an investor or a business partner, whatever it is, any kind of goodwill that's created. I mean, we built a business based on goodwill. And when you think about that, how many businesses have you ever seen based on goodwill? And everybody told us it won't work. It's not possible. And we're like, we don't, we don't care what anybody else says. So, so you build a whole business on goodwill. That's pretty cool. It is. Uh, it's a great advice too. Um, I want to go back because you took a Tasty Trade. I'm sorry, you took Thinkorswim Public in a very unusual way. Yeah. You just want to tell a little bit, share that story. We 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 merged with another company that was a public company, and so we effectively we we it was kind of a weird. They wanted to buy us, but we ended up owning them. And so, and how did that unfold, and why 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 was that something you decided you ultimately wanted to do? Well, here's the problem. So when we first built. Think or some, we're market makers. And when I say market makers, that means, you know, we're, we're kind of traders, but we, we've always been the business of making markets. So if you want to buy this iced tea and I think it's worth a dollar, I'll offer it to you for $2. If you say you pay $2, I'll sell it to you. I have no choice because I offered it to you. So, you know, so if I think this bottle of water is worth 50 cents and you want to pay a dollar for it, I mean, even though I'm thirsty, I'll still sell it to you because that's just how our minds work. So we thought our company was worth about $200 million. And we're, you know, we had built a really nice business and we loved our business. We didn't want to sell it. And somebody walked in the door and said, how much do you want for this business? And we said, you know, we're, we're not for sale because we weren't for sale. And then they said, well, we'll give you 375 million. Now, when you think your company's worth 200 and they give you 375 million, you're like, all right, it's yours. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know what else you're supposed to do. You know, that's just the way, you know. I mean, remember, this is like, you don't want to pull like what Yahoo did to Microsoft, right? When, when at the time, you know, Microsoft offered them $32, the next thing you know, it's tra they're trading for 15. I mean, you, you know, think if somebody's going to pay you 100% premium or whatever it is, you know, so then I turned to my partner, Scott, at the time, and I said, hey, Scott, I think I just sold the company. And he's like, what? And I'm like, yeah, I made a market and the guy took our offer. And he's like, do they have any money? I'm like, I don't know, we'll see. And... Um, and, and they did, they were a public company. And so then we ended up actually buying them out. 
ultimately, and putting them out of business, and then just keeping the public company. Um, and so ultimately, we were a public company during the meltdown of 2008, 2009, and- Tell, tell that story, because I think both the timing of the sale wasn't where you would like to have sold it, but oh. also there's an interesting sort of coincidental story with this. Yeah, really cool story. So, so Thinkorswim became a public company under the symbol SWIM. We were a billion dollar company for a, a short period of time, a couple months, but most of the time we were hovering around three quarters of a billion dollars. And, and all, then all of a sudden, in the middle of the meltdown, three companies at the same time tried to buy us and were public. And they all tried to buy us, but they didn't want to do it as hostile. So they sat down with us. And our board was like freaking out because they were like, you have to take one of these deals. And I'm like, we don't want to take one of these deals. So we voted against all the deals. But eventually the board was like, we have too much risk voting against these deals. So we're going to, you know, because boards have risk. Like, you got to take one of these deals. So they're like, we want you to take the TD Ameritrade deal because they have the most money. The other two companies were a little bit smaller. So... TD Ameritrade said, we want to buy you. We're like, well, we don't want your money. We want your stock because the market was melting down and we thought the market was way oversold. It was the end of 2008, 2009, and we didn't want their money because money the, money made the deal accretive to them, but money didn't mean anything to us. because It means you, you get it at the low low value. That's right. Trade low. So we wanted their stock, which was all the way down to like 11 or $12. They didn't have any stock left to give us. But at the same time, the Ricketts wanted who Ricketts owned, who owned they started TD Ameritrade. They wanted to buy the Cubs, so we did a three-way deal. As crazy as this is going to sound, the Ricketts needed three hundred and fifty million dollars to buy cash to finish out their Cub deal. We needed three hundred fifty million dollars worth of stock, so TD bought the stock from the Ricketts, gave the stock to us, and effectively the Ricketts bought the Cubs. They bought us. And that was the whole three-way deal. It was like a three-way trade. It was, it was interesting. We still, well didn't for want, everybody. we still didn't want to sell. Yeah. You know what? We hated the idea of selling the company. We, were, we voted against it still, but we were, it really bothered us because that was our sweat equity. And we, we didn't want to sell. We loved that company. And as soon as we sold it, we're like, well, we have to do something else. And we started Tasty Trade. And now Tasty Trade is Tasty Trade and Tasty Works because we're really one company. Um, it's it's the favorite thing. I, it's my most favorite thing I've ever done. This has been the crazy rewarding experience. So sometimes you know you make a deal and you don't like the deal, but you're like, I got to live with this, and I'm, it's cool. I mean, it's this has been this company has just been incredible, and we get a chance to talk every day to 100,000 viewers, approximately 100,000 viewers a day. We get a chance to bullshit on air. We get a chance to make fun of each other. We get a chance to trade all day long. We built the best new technology in the industry. And we're having a lot of fun, and 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 now I'm 60, and we're starting our next company. We have a, one last idea in 2018, and I'll be 61. That's cool. I like it. Well, let's take some audience questions here. Um, if you didn't if you didn't need the money, why did you go out looking for the money and wasting time on due diligence in the first place? I read these verbatim. Okay, so <laughs> there's no such thing as you you don't need. The, of course, if you have a profitable company and you have money in the bank, you don't need money. But when money is cheap and you can get money because people want to invest in you, you have to take it. You absolutely have to take it. When money, when you need money, it's ridiculously expensive and everybody has their claws into you. When you don't need money and people want to give it to you and you can do it on your terms, it's a simple trade. Everybody should do it. Most entrepreneurs are so scared of dilution and control, things like that, it doesn't phase us at all. We will always take the money and, and dilute and just build up and stockpile money because when other people need money, you can make good deals. Good. Um, one of the other questions was you talked about building the company on a vision rather than on market needs. And the question was, obviously you were right, but um, how would one know if they were wrong and how would some course corrector think about trying to navigate that because, as you said, not every trade works out. So, so we've, we've interviewed almost 1,700 companies since we started our bootstrapping segment You know, six years ago, a little over six years ago, almost seven years now. And I would say of the 1,700 companies, there's a handful of billion-dollar companies that have been created, and there's about 1,500 that are no longer around. And so, so we've got to experience firsthand you know, a lot of the failures and what doesn't work for people. And you know, some of it, I think, is their ability to articulate whatever their vision is. Other people, it's just not a great idea. Other people, they run out of capital, whatever it is. But 
what you can never, the biggest mistake you can make is not pursuing whatever your vision is. Like, like, I'll tell you what I tell our attorneys all the time. I'm not interested in your advice. I'm not interested in your business advice. I'll listen to your legal advice, but don't ever tell me how to run my business. And I think it's the same thing when it comes to you know, people that are starting a business. It's, it's your vision, it's your idea, go for it. I, I tell my kids, I tell every single person that ever asked me, should I do this? If the question is, should I do this? My answer is always yes. Now that assumes certain things. That assumes like reasonable pot odds. That assumes, you know, it's not a crazy shot. But for all that, the answer is always go for it. Always. Never say, let me think about it and never say no. Um, so the question is, takes th taking three years to get to market, you know, building technology um, would be hard to do today. Um, in terms of the, describe, the question is the kiss of death uh, to be that long and needing that much funding. Um, and the question was, what would you do differently if you had to start it today? Well, we- Or we, face that challenge today. Yeah, you know, that, that's a, what would we do differently? And, and I'm, I'm, I don't know. You, you know, because it, people, people ask, ask, actually ask that question a lot. They say, if you could do it all over again, what would you do different? Or if you could, you know, do something, I, I, I don't know. Because we're constantly thinking that we're building the next, our next company, and I don't even know what that's going to look like. So I don't know what I would do different. I, I think, again, one of the biggest takeaways from this event tonight is just understand the importance of quick decision making and your ability to practice quick decision making. One of the things I love about trading and the financial markets, and Chicago is kind of the, the home of this, the hub, is that you have an opportunity for a very small amount of money to participate in a listed marketplace where you can take emotional risk and monetary risk 10,000 times a year if you want to. That changes your ability to, to process logic and engage in a decision-making mechanic, a series of decision-making mechanics that cha will change the way you think about entrepreneurship. Successful entrepreneurs make quick decisions and they make good decisions over time because they understand kind of the probabilities, the statistics and the logic. And if you can make a bunch of trades, you can kind of tra change your mind. It's it's a in the in the in academia they call it economic bias, but in trading we just call it quick decision making and your ability to say no to certain things and your ability to say yes. And I can't stress that enough. It's great advice. Um, people in the fintech world have an interest in knowing your opinion on uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, that sort of world, the blockchain. So we're, we're like everybody else. We're absolutely fascinated by, you know, I mean, I own some Bitcoins, although I've lost my wallet. Um, I interviewed, yeah, I know, it's a, it's, I'm stupid. Um, I, it's somewhere, we'll find it eventually. I interviewed the, the founder of Ethereum before, when he was like 18, I think I was the first interview. I, I was the first person that he ever did an interview with Wow. From, from his basement, from his mom's basement in Canada somewhere. Um, and he was like, he's like, and he tells us before we went on air, he says, you know, these things are only like, I think they were three to five cents at the time when we interviewed. He's like, you should be buying these. And I'm like, yeah, sure, kid. You know, <laughs> um, it's like we, one of the guys that works with us, is, his name is Dylan Radigan. He used to be, he works for Tasty Trade now, and he used to be on uh, MSNBC and, 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 and uh, CNBC. And he was the host. And, and Dylan did an interview once with um, Mark Zuckerberg. He did his first interview. And he goes, he didn't want to do the interview because he didn't think Mark Zuckerberg was anybody who would ever amount to anything. He's like, I'm not interviewing some college kid. And so I feel the same way with interviewing the, the guy that uh, started Ethereum. But um, I, we're fascinated by it. Unfortunately, and we're in a business that can that would love to use ledger technology. We would love to use, um, we would love to be able to transfer funds so much, you know, it, it, it's so much more efficient, it's it's so much quicker, and yet the industry hasn't caught up. So we don't focus on things like if if we could trade Bitcoin, if we could trade it in a liquid market, in an efficient market, and it had more scale. The problem with Bitcoin is we trade more in five minutes in our platform in notional liquidity than Bitcoin trades in a year. So, so it's really difficult to trade it because the markets are just too thin and too small. And when you get to Ethereum, you're talking about you know, a fraction of Bitcoin size. So will Bitcoin in our lifetime, in our kids' lifetime, be huge? I think so. Will cryptocurrencies not necessarily dominate, but they will have their, a very important place in moving money? 
I don't think in consumer transactions, but I think in moving money, and I think as tradable, investable assets, absolutely. Great. Um, so you've been a great entrepreneur. You've done this a few times, had a lot of success. Uh, talked about Chicago being kind of the derivatives capital. Yeah. Christie did the, 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 you know, making markets. Um, what do you think about Chicago for fintech? And is fintech really the right term, or should we unpack it, break it down further to really think about? companies? Well, I don't really know what fintech means, but Chicago is, I mean, I, I understand the general concept, but I don't really get, you know, there's a lot of firms that, that call themselves fintech firms. The hardest thing about Chicago is, I kind of feel like if, first of all, I love Chicago, and I've been here 36 years, this is where I live, and I live in the city, and, and I'll never move in any of that stuff. But I kind of feel like if we were anywhere else in America, we'd have a lot easier time hiring developers. <laughs> um, it, in Chicago, there is incredible competition because of the high frequency firms and all the prop firms and all the really successful financial companies. Like Chicago is the hub of prop trading firms, which means proprietary trading firms, which means they trade their own money. And most of the liquidity providers are in Chicago. Most of the firms that have the best high speed technology are in Chicago and they pay a ridiculous amount of well, money. So I, I told Don Wilson once, who's one of the, one of the great sure. prop firms, DRW, and he said, I said, Don, you hired some of our guys away. You offered them twice as much. He said, Pat, I offered them five to 10 times as much. Yeah. He said, it's, it, and, and by the way, it's a great trade. I'd make it every time. It's it, what, they, what they can develop for us is, is worth it. But for startups, they break the market. It's exactly the problem. So I, I'll give you an example. My, I have a nephew that just graduated and um, uh, just graduated from Wash U. And he's just got a job in Chicago. So he said, can I stay with you for a couple of, days until I until my apartment's ready. I go, sure. So he got a job with a high frequency trading firm. And I go, why don't you talk to me? I didn't even know you were a Java developer. My own nephew, and he's like, he's like, you can't afford me. <laughs> 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 I saw what you guys pay. You can't afford me. <laughs> so um, that's my own nephew. I almost threw him out last night. <laughs> that's great. So uh, two questions we always ask at the end, um, sure. just retrospectively. Um, you know, this is more like lessons learned that you've already probably internalized, so it's not. But are there things that you learned along the way in those million trades and those hundreds of thousands that weren't the right trades? That it, is there a pattern that emerges? Say, like, boy, you know, this type of thing I'd never do again. I really learned that I want to steer clear of something like that. What, what would it have been? Could have been from the early days, of course. Yeah, well, what I've learned from talking to my cardiologist is I will never eat fried food again. <laughs> okay, that's the single most important thing that's affected my life. Other than that, um, you know, it, it's kind of, I, I don't know how to answer the question of things that we, that we wouldn't do. But I, I would say that, that- The other half of it is what would you always do again? Is there some lesson? I, that I would most... always, we always choose. I mean, Christy and I, we, 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 we talk about this every day. We, we argue about it. And then we ultimately come to the same decision. Every time we have an opportunity to take risk, we take it. Same with same with Scott. Same with everybody else that's part of our um, our management team. Every time we have an opportunity to take risk, we take it, and and we do that like there's no standing still for us. Like, and, and we're not trying to make like we're not trying to be the next. And why why has that been the right decision? I mean, it's, it, you know, people might hear you and say, "Well, he's a risk taker," but obviously, it's a smart bet. It's been a good trade for you. Sure. Rule of thumb for trading. So why do you think that's a general like a uh, why do you think that's worked so well, and, and what would be the takeaway for folks listening? Well, I think if you look at the firms, when you when you sit around and you talk to successful entrepreneurs, and you have an opportunity over time to you know, and, and I'm sure you've had a, a ton of them on this on this these discussions, but when you listen to you know the decisions of kind of like you know the Brad Keywells of the world and the Elon Musk of the world, the, the real the real outliers, the one one millionth of one percent. The outliers that turn, you know, that create multiple billion-dollar companies, and you look at the way they just operate and the way their minds work, it seems like they take a ridiculous amount of risk in their decision making. But the reality is, all of it is incredibly calculated. And when they make, when they have an opportunity to make a decision, they go for it. And and that's something that you just you can't you just don't see that with people. Like when we first started our network, we used to say to people. If you can order a pizza, if you can order a pizza, you can trade. And we kind of want to take that to like 
18 different levels, you know, to, to different degrees of that. But essentially say to people, you know, if you can make a decision and a fast decision and you're and you believe in your decision, you will be successful. Believe it or not, there's there's so many great ideas. There's so many entrepreneurs in Chicago. There's so many people here at 1871 that have incredible ideas. But for a lot of people, it's it's not like we they don't have the smarts, it's not that they don't have the money. It's just that at some point, the decision-making becomes overwhelming and the risk becomes overwhelming. And if you're not comfortable taking emotional and monetary risk, it's really hard to do. Well, it's been a great story and the story behind the story is incredible. Thanks so much for sharing it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.